Welcome to Akopi with the FinTech Pod. We'll explore the latest trends, innovations, and ideas shaping the financial industry. Join host Alex Irigoyen as he interviews leading experts in the field. Learn from top CFO, tech leaders, investors, and many more. Join us and get inspired. Let's get started. Hi, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of uh, Coffee With. Today we have with us William Glass. William, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, Alex. I'm excited to be here. Appreciate you having me on. Awesome. How it's been the, the week so far, William? It's been good. It's been good. Uh, we've got some new team members joining, uh, and so that's been fun onboarding them and just focused on driving revenue. So uh, you, you know you know how it goes, Alex, right? <laughs> Always okay. working on growth and and uh, and trying to bring more revenue in the door. Awesome. Sounds sounds great. So, William, you're the founder and CEO of Ostrich. I really want to deep into Ostrich and what we do. But previous to that, I would like to uh, for you to share a little bit from your background. You have background as an actor, as a model, sales as well, entrepreneur. So if you could give us some context in in there, how it's been that that journey, how you move from, from one place to the other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll try to somehow connect the dots there. Um, yeah, growing up as a, as a kid, I um, I uh, was, was, a, was a model. So like did commercials and, and, and small things like that. Um, growing up, I had, uh, grandparents that were super creative. Grandfather was a comedian. Grandmother was a big band singer and my mom was an actress and lived in LA for a while. And so that's why I kind of got into, uh, the, the acting side. And I did, um, I did a, a commercial for Cracker Barrel, which is like a Southern food. I'm, I grew up in, in Alabama. So, uh, in Birmingham, it's like a Southern food, uh, restaurant chain. And um, I, I was probably like eight or nine and got pulled out of school for a, a day and um, like just ran around, pretending like I was eating food, laughing. Like it was just, it was awesome, right? It was a ton of fun. And uh, my dad pulled me aside and um, made the comment. It was like, you're making $2,700. And, you know, this is a while ago. And he's like, that's more than some people make an entire month. And like, you're getting to do something fun that you enjoy. Um, and that kind of really resonated with me. It kind of implanted this idea of entrepreneurship. And I think it ties into sales as well, that um, you can do things that you really enjoy and make a lot of money doing them, but also your your earning potential isn't necessarily tied to your time. So um, that kind of like implanted that and, you know, get, continue to do other things. That was one of the, the, the better paying gigs that I that I ever did. Um, and uh and yeah, and so that's kind of like what started my my interest in, in personal finance, connecting that, um, and then ended up going to, to school down in down in Orlando. Was an international relations major. Went over to, to Thailand for a year through the State Department. Taught English over there. Was in rural Thailand, um, living on like four hundred dollars a month as a stipend. Managed to save a bunch of money, uh, which is crazy, but still got to travel around Southeast Asia, which puts into perspective, you know, cost of living. Um, and uh, and when I came back, I I, I wanted to to, to, um, dive in. I've always been interested in entrepreneurship, um, and wanted to dive into that, dive into that world. And one of the places to start is sales. And, um, I was really nervous, had never done anything like that and ended up in technology sales, um, pushed myself. And partially it was also going back to that, like lesson learned as a, as a kid, um, of like, you know, I want to leverage my time to make more, to make more money. And so sales gives you that opportunity where if you're hitting commissions and bonuses and things like that, you know, you're going to get comped for working harder um, than anyone else. And so that's sort of how I got into sales and uh, the technology side and learned a lot of skills. And that pulled me into the tech world, worked for a company called Gartner, worked with startups that were growth stage, series A, B, C, D, all across different sectors um, that were selling to like enterprise tech um, and got poached to work for a client, ended up in New York, worked for an AI market research startup, um, and then eventually started Ostrich. So like, Plenty of stuff that I can dive in there, but that's sort of how it all <laughs> connects, Alex. Yeah, that's a that's a great journey. And now you are the co-founder and CEO of Ostrich. So it's uh, if I'm not wrong, right? For managing personal personal finance, how did you end up from Gardner saying, okay, now I'm going to start in this specific category, right? For for personal 
expense management or, or financial management? Yeah, great question. So um, growing up, I'm, I'm also only grandchild on both sides of the family. It's not only an only child, but also the only grandchild. And um, growing up, I had multiple members of my family that filed bankruptcy and just saw how uh, parents' relationship fell apart partially due to financial stress and just saw how not getting this piece right affects so many other areas of our lives. And I felt really responsible to help support my family. And, um, you know, also saw that like, if you get this stuff right, there's things that you can do when you're younger that can set you up for success and help avoid a lot of um, challenges down the line. Um, and, you know, consumed all kinds of content and books and resources and um, started just diving deeper into the, the problem space and um, realized that the solution that most people tout for personal finance to, doesn't actually work, which is financial literacy. You hear folks say, hey, we need to teach this in high school. We need to teach this in college. We need to teach more financial literacy. But if you actually look at the data, there's a ton of research that shows that financial literacy doesn't lead to better outcomes. It only changes behavior 0.1%. And this is just consistently, they've looked at a number of, uh, of longitudinal studies across many different programs over decades. Um, so what's missing? And that's where we realized um, it's action. It's the incentives. It's the action. How do you get somebody just because they might understand a credit score or that they should save or that they should invest? How do you actually get somebody to take that action? And so that's really what we're doing at Ostrich is we're solving for that that action side of, of personal finance. So it's, you know, education, financial literacy, you still need it, but you really need action that leads to better outcomes. And so that's sort of where the concept idea for Ostrich comes in and where we focus um, and specifically work with, um, you know, younger folks that are just starting out. So like college age. That's awesome. That's awesome. So what's the journey, let's say for a new user, right? Or let's assume I want to register. I want to put all my personal finance in, in place, how how it's going the app is going to help me. What's going to be the the journey for me as a as a user? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's pretty straightforward. When you sign up, we ask you some questions, some basic questions on the front end. Um, it's that gives you a financial health score. So it shows you how where you are today, and then also how you compare to your peers, um, and what's the simplest, easiest things that you can do to improve. And we're not looking at numbers because when you're 18, 19, 20, 21, you know, like you, you know, you're not at your highest earning potential. A lot of those kids are still relying on parents, family, um, you know, they're not fully in their career yet. So it's more focused on like, do you have the right stuff? Are you taking the right actions? Do you have the right behaviors? Um, and then we focus on like three main areas, which is helping people build credit safely. Um, so there's ways to build credit without credit cards and educating people on if you're going to get a credit card, how to use it, um, saving. So building an emergency fund and then understanding saving, um, investing. So like the power of compound interest and how a little bit of money earlier on has a huge impact over the course of your life invested. Um, and then we, uh, and then we also focus on helping people stay out of debt. So those are sort of like the basic things and the experiences we have these social challenges. So you join challenges with your friends. Um, so if you, if you don't have an emergency fund, that's the first sort of action open up that emergency fund, and then you can earn um, rewards by making progress towards your savings goal. And you do that in, in these, these challenges that we have on the app, and you do that with other people that are also working towards that same goal. So using a little bit of like social accountability, community, and then an incentive rewards layer to drive that long-term behavior. Yeah. So it's kind of related with a bit of gamification and, and social with your, with your peers, right? Exactly, exactly. And we learned that like this demographic linking bank accounts and all those things like that's, it's a barrier. So we really focus on like, what's just the most important thing that we can do. And, and, and that's where we focus today. So that's great. That's great. And in terms of, of investing the compound interest, are you suggesting yeah, places where they have to invest like uh, ETFs or, or, or what kind of investment suggestions do the user have? Yeah, I mean, we're super, like, super basic. So, um, you know, for folks that just want to start but don't have a lot of money and then also just don't want to think about, like, stocks or anything like that, you know, we recommend our partners. So we partner with a lot of different um, products that are really good for folks just starting out. Um, and Acorns, for example, is one of, our, one of our partners, right? So we recommend Acorns and just, you know, go through that. You end up with a bunch of low-cost index funds 
and yeah. you're good to go. Um, and if folks do want to go out and, and buy like the, what I do and what we recommend and what my co-founder and the rest of the team does is, you know, we buy low cost index funds, mostly VOO. Literally yesterday, I, um, I like rolled over, uh, rolled over an old 401k that I had and had to reinvest everything and literally just bought, you know, put it all in VOO essentially. Um, so just very basic stuff. Like we're, we're just, we want people to focus on the other things that are important in life and just feel safe about having a strong financial foundation. So, um, yeah, that's sort of our, our recommendations is long-term kind of set it and forget it. So. Yeah. 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 I, I started also with that, uh, strategy but then you end up with your peers okay instead of investing in this etf let's buy this stock right that i heard that a friend is working in there and it's going up and at the end of the day it's like okay all the work all the work that we've done for nothing because this this stock just dropped like a 500 percent and we are out so I, yeah that's that's a, a common mistake that that we've done with, uh, quite absolutely a yeah. And like, it's, it's like, take a little bit and have fun and like make some of those bets. But with the majority of what you're investing, you know, just play, play it easy, you know, play it safe and you'll, you'll be, you'll be fine. Um, so as long as the U S economy is doing well, you'll, you'll be all right. So. Yeah, absolutely. And um, which ones would you say that are William, the, like the biggest mistakes that you see, uh, in young people doing fin financially, right? Is it like getting, for example, I don't know, into college debt, getting a car, or, or where do you see this, this biggest mistake happen? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest mistake is not to, like not taking action. And, and, and a lot of this is um, understandable. So there's a lot of things that you can do, whether you have really money coming in or not, <laughs> um, whether like, you know, whatever your kind of financial situation is, you rely on parents or family, or, you know, you work part time, there's things that you can do with even a little bit of money that build a foundation. And so those things aren't being done. So like, it's, it's really interesting, like uh, basic things like using a high yield savings account instead of a regular savings account for people that are saving, um, building credit, a lot of, there's a huge mis misconception that, um, especially with young people that if you don't have a credit card, you don't have a credit score. And obviously like that's, that's not how it works. Like credit, your credit score is based on all types of debt. So there's other ways that you can build credit and you can do it with like, you can do it very young. Um, and there's a bunch of ways that you can do it where it's not like you have to take out a loan or you have to open a credit card if you don't want to do it. But it's super important because when you graduate and you go to sign that lease for your first apartment or whatever it is, if you don't have a credit score, you're going to have to get mom and dad to co-sign and hopefully they've got a good credit. Um, right. So like it becomes a lot harder to navigate to navigate the world and you can't get credit overnight. So, um, I would say those are some of the most common ones. And then same thing with investing people kind of overcomplicate it. And there's super simple ways that you can just get started with five, $10 now with some of the apps that are out there. Um, and so that's why I say like the biggest challenge is, um, action and mistake is the fact that there are things that you can do when you're young that people don't do. And so they wait and there's never a perfect time to start. Right. And so it gets pushed off and it gets pushed off. It's like, Oh, well, I'll wait till I have a full-time job. And then all of a sudden they're like, Oh wow. Like now I'm in a new career. I've maybe I've moved, moved to a new city. I'm trying to make new friends. I'm trying to make sure I don't I figure out work stuff. What's this 401k thing? What's health insurance. And they don't do some of the basic things that they could have done sooner. And it keeps getting pushed off and pushed off. So it's, it's the lack of action, I think is the biggest, the biggest challenge and, um, just the biggest mistake that young people, but people of all ages make. Yeah. I, I don't know who I heard this from, but it was, a another podcast where was this guy saying, okay, probably what we should do is take for every newborn, take 20, 20 K put that in a index fund, SP 500, whatever that is, and wait 70 years. So they get back those 20 that they can convert, I don't know, in, in a million or, or whatever. And, and that's it. That was the, that was the plan. Yeah. I think that's uh, I think Bill Ackman, it may not have been him, but it's one of him. He's like a billionaire, uh, hedge fund guy. Yeah. That's one of his things. And like the math totally makes sense, right? It, it, it as long as the U S continues to, to do what it's done over the last 200 plus years, yeah, it's it's a it's a, it's a solid bet. Um, 
the question is getting people to, you know, where do, how do you convince the government to give people the money and, and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I mean, the math works, the math works. Yeah. The math was very, very surprising. We were like, okay, never, never thought about it, but yeah, I, I guess the, the, those numbers don't lie. Yeah, it's time. Time is your biggest thing. So I, I've, I've got this, this sort of like, uh, I'd love to do this, and I, I, I have to figure out like which we have to partner with like another financial services company. But I'd love to like work with a newborn, so like a family, and like build their credit up. And so you have like a two year old that has better credit than you know most of the. Because there's, like I said, there's simple things that there's simple things that you can do to build credit, and it it also sort of highlights like how silly some of the systems are, but also how easy it can be to set yourself up for success. So I, I kind of like I like that idea of the investing early, and if you can do that as a parent, you know, for your kids, and put five six thousand dollars down, put it in an S and P five hundred index fund, and let the dividends reinvest and forget about it, yeah, you'll you'll set your kid up for success for sure. So interesting, interesting. William, one of the things that I want to ask you, of course, it's the impact of AI in personal finance, in investing as as well. What's your what's your thought on that? Yeah. There's there's a bunch of products that are coming out that are trying to bring investing advice um and make it more accessible. And I think that there's there's gonna be something there that's impactful. Um, I mean, if you think about some of the like algorithms and everything else that's going on already, like we essentially have some level of AI that's built into like the trading system. So I think that that's a whole nother conversation. But if we just look at like the personal finance space, I think that's the biggest opportunity. Um, but at the same time, if you look at the job of an actual financial advisor, so I think AI can help bring a financial advisor to everyone. But if you look at what the actual job of a financial advisor is, yeah, they might help you make some investment suggestions or things like that. But really what they do is they manage emotions. So when the market's crashing and a client wants to sell everything, like they're there to talk to them or, hey, I want to retire or, hey, this major life thing came up. Like, can we afford it? Like, that's really what the financial advisor's job is. It's like to manage emotions and sort of help keep people on the right path. So I think that's where there's a really interesting thing with AI. I don't know, how, like, I don't think it's empathetic enough. I don't think that you can connect with it quite enough. But like, over time, I think that's what what gets really interesting. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that's part of the impact. I believe that where we are with Ostrich, which is getting people started and like getting over the action side of things, like that is still that is still a barrier that will exist because you've got to get somebody to opt in and make that decision, whether it is even just signing up for an AI product or starting to use a, a finance tool that uses AI. So I still think there's that problem that we're sort of solving, which is like getting people to actually take that action. That's a little different. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, that's what I see. And again, I'm not, it's still super early. Um, and I'm sure there's a thousand other use cases out there that, that could be really interesting, but that's where I'm most interested when it comes to AI and, and the personal finance space. Great. You also have William, a uh, podcast over a hundred, 120, if I'm not wrong, episodes talking about entrepreneurship. I don't know if it's focused entrepreneurship in the New York area or it's a, a, a bit more, more broad. Could you share uh, how it's been with 120 episodes? Sounds like, like a lot. So I yeah. think you a super, super wide also overview of, of the ecosystem, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so Silicon Alley is the name of the name of the podcast and the focus is mostly on New York, but it's not exclusive to New York, but it's more New York centric in terms of, um, you know, founders, investors, the, the folks that we that, that try to bring on. And it's, it's more about telling those like stories, the, the personal stories behind everything um, and, and hopefully learning and leaving the audience with something that they can apply in their own journey or keeping them motivated. So it's sort of like a how I built this with a little bit more like tactical, um, more tactical things built into it. Um, and it's been awesome. Like I've just been able to connect with some really incredible founders, investors um, through the podcast, uh, like networked with billionaires and like, just like all kinds of like really cool, cool things that have happened because of it. Um, and it's something that's just so simple, but I actually started it out of my own need to just like connect, like as a, I was a first time founder didn't really know anyone. The pandemic hit and it was like, well, how am I going to like meet people and learn? Well, let me start a podcast and just start talking to people. And, uh, and, and I'm sure, as you know, Alex, you get to meet some really awesome folks that you wouldn't necessarily otherwise get to. And you get to have really cool conversations and ask questions that 
you just can't, you just don't get to ask in, in everyday life. Um, so yeah, that's, that's been my experience. Absolutely. And how do you see then now, William, the, the entrepreneurship ecosystem, the venture capital, the market as a, as a whole, right? It's been with all the recession plus the AI, so much disruption right now. What's your, what, what do you take from, from this situation? Yeah, I think there are some things that are happening that are really interesting, right? Revenue, bootstrapping, these types of concepts that were like, you know, two years ago would have been like, why, why are you trying to, you know, become profitable? Like what, what, what is going on? Um, just grow, just grow is now like the default of like, okay, well, where are you at from a revenue perspective? And obviously like valuations have come down, the metrics to success have now sort of come down. Like what it took to raise an A is now what it takes to rate it, raise a seed. Um, so like some of these, from a revenue perspective, like some of these metrics have like come down just because, because the market isn't as hot. Um, but I think there's still a ton of innovation and like, obviously AI is creating a lot of opportunity. I think that there's probably way too many AI startups out there that are not really doing anything that's kind of interesting in AI. Um, similar to like what happened with web three and crypto, like a year or two ago, they were like, everyone wanted to be web three or crypto. And now it's, everybody wants to be AI. Um, which I don't think this is news to, to anyone, but I do think what's interesting is that there is this sort of going back to fundamentals because every startup at the end of the day, like has to show a path to profitability or it's, it's just not going to be sustainable. So like, even though the venture model is grow quickly and that's how we're going to, you know, that's how we're going to, going to make our money is through these, you know, going from a go having, you know, unicorn type exits, but at the end of the day, once it gets dumped on the public market, if everything that gets dumped there is non not profitable and you keep seeing things keep seeing these companies drop and fall like there's no there's not going to be a way to exit anymore so i think that like this desire to build sustainable businesses profitable businesses is is a good thing um and i don't think it i don't think it hurts from a from a founder perspective i think it's actually a much healthier way to, uh, to, to think about building a company, even if you are raising venture capital and you are going to, you know, be unprofitable for a while, you're still thinking more and forced to think in more unit economics. So that's what I'm, I'm seeing, um, personally. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Great. What about I you, Alex? Like... Are you, are you getting any of that too? I know you talk to a lot of founders as well. Yeah, no, definitely profitability. That's one of the, uh, biggest topics that I, that I see. Everybody is trying to well, definitely cut, cut costs is something that we've seen a lot. So uh, that's been, I, I'll say, the biggest driver. It's been cut cost and trying to be more efficient in, in customer acquisition, right? So look into those unit economics that maybe that uh, lifetime value cut ratio. In, in the past, it was more like, okay, whatever, we just <laughs> But now that seems to be very, very important to be as efficient as possible with your with your capital and have the the expense that you need to to work, but not not uh, overheads that are that are necessary. And that's one one of the questions that I want to make you back, William. I I heard you you have some strategies for customer acquisition, some incentives, some some tips. I don't know if you could share that with with our audience, what, what are those tricks that we can have for customer acquisition to drive those uh, unit economics back to the, to the basics, right? Before, before the, the easy, the easy money. Yeah. I mean, obviously every, every company is different, but I can share what, what we've been doing. That's been working really well, which is not something that we necessarily would have done maybe, you know, 12 months ago, um, or 18 months ago in terms of acquisition is we've been doing a lot of things that quote, aren't scalable in the terms of like real life events and the opportunity to connect with real people. Um, so like, for example, our demographic is, is college students. Um, and we've got like a, a dual sale where we can sell directly to consumers, but we can also sell to the school themselves. And so what we found is we can use that to our advantage. So what we do is we do these events on college campuses um, and we go directly to the student organizations because they can make decisions in a day right? To bring people in. And it's still a group of people. So we're bringing on a cluster of customers. So we're finding a group, a community that already exists. We're tapping into it. We're looking for short sales cycles. And what we do is we do these really fun trivia nights that are personal finance themes. We have partnerships with like Red Bull and Chipotle and 
uh, a direct to consumer condom company called Champ and the stuffed animal company called Huggables. And we work with these student groups. We give away a bunch of free prizes. So like we bring them in, we're already working into their existing workflow. We tap into existing communities and we use other partners that want to get in front of our audience as a way to efficiently acquire those users. And it's been super, super effective for us. Um, we've been averaging like $29 in revenue per user and our acquisition cost is like five bucks. So like you talk about that CAC to LTV ratio, um, you know, and that's just on that initial sort of event that we do. And obviously there's a, a challenge around scalability. How many can you do? How many people do you need? But in terms of like jump starting initial customer base, that's been super effective. And then we're able to use the learnings and the data that we gather from the students that we work with to then go to the school and say, hey, we've had this impact on this subset of your students. Wouldn't it be incredible if we worked with your entire student population or more of your student population? And then we work the school sales cycle. So we're able to use the data, the learnings from that to move quickly, drive revenue, build traction, build growth. And we use incentives that people people like, which is free stuff from other companies. And, uh, and then use that as a way to then go to the school and say, hey, now we have actual data and we're able to shorten the school sales cycle time because now we actually have, we've essentially done a POC with just without their permission, essentially. We've just figured out our own way to do our own proof of concept. So it's like a, a kind of like hacky way of like, you know, getting everything to play into each other. Um, yeah. So like if you can find those types of things that may not necessarily be scalable in the short term, but get you super close to your customers, um, like that's, what's been really effective for us is just finding quick ways to get in front of people, groups of people, and then seeing if we can find partnerships to bring our, our CAC down. So love it, love it. can I invest? <laughs> yeah, you're welcome to, uh, well, we're actually not raising right now, but, uh, you know, we, we can work something out, Alex. So <laughs> awesome, awesome. It, it, it won't change much at your, your fundraising. I, I, I promise that. Awesome. So just la last question, William, for, for those, uh, I mean, you're definitely in, in contact with people out from college. What would you suggest them going to a career more the traditional way? Or are you suggesting them more to go into a startup or kind of tech world? What, what, what do you think is the best, the best output out of business school in, in, in college? Uh, I mean, that's hard to say. Everyone's, everyone's different. I personally enjoy the startup world, but I also went corporate and learned a lot of really important things, things that I liked, things that I didn't like, learned some really important skill sets and made some connections that have been really helpful from a startup perspective. So I don't know what the perfect path is. I think that like, what's important is to try certain things and your career is going to change. What you like is going to change. What you think you want to do for the next, you know, 20 years is, may not be, you might find out you absolutely hate it after six months. So I think that like just experimenting and I, I think there is a ton of value if you're going to go the startup route in terms of like just the amount of things that you learn in such a short amount of time and the amount of ownership that you have you may not get, you won't get paid nearly as well. Um, but what you'll learn and the responsibility you have will be greater at the same time, you know, if somebody needs that consistent corporate structure that paycheck, then, you know, so it's, it's hard for me to answer that, Alex, because I think it really truly does depend on the individual, what they want. Um, but I think that uh, just being able to like try a bunch of things that you think you're interested in and not just taking the first job that pays you, um, you know, and again, now things could change, right? If the market, by the time this podcast comes, like maybe everything, the market goes to, to hell and everybody, you just, you do need to take any job that you get, but if you can, uh, you know, and you can survive, try to find things that you're, you're interested in and, and you're going to have a, a much better time, um, you know, learning new skills, connecting, networking and, and, and building relationships and building your career. So. Awesome. Love, love the insights. William, it's been a pleasure having you today in the, in the pod. I really enjoy our conversation and I'm looking forward for the next one already. Yeah, thanks, Alex. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're you ask really good questions, and I I'm uh, yeah I appreciate you having me on. So, um, yeah, happy to come back anytime. Great. Have a great day, William. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, Alex.